Welcome to the Solid Edge University 2022 version of Baker's Dozen of Solid Edge Tips and Tricks, Part 1. If you attended the Solid Edge University live in Toronto, you've already seen this presentation, but we did promise to put it on our blog for those who couldn't attend. So this is Part 1 of this Tips and Tricks session. The tips and tricks are inspired by questions from our tech line and questions received from training. And as noted, this presentation will be posted on our blog site as previous tips and tricks presentations have been. And this blog is part one of this tips and tricks presentation. For those of you on older versions, you do not need Solid Edge 2022 for these tips and tricks. The first tip and trick will be the base reference plane size adjustment. There's a lot of benefits to resizing your base reference planes. The base planes can provide a scale of reference for creating your sketch. It reduces the use of zoom and fit commands. Now you can resize the base reference planes from your solid edge options on the general tab. And you can see here in metric the default is 120. But this must be done outside of the sketch environment. Once you go into the sketch environment, you cannot access this. Let me demonstrate the benefits of resizing your reference plane. To demonstrate the benefits of resizing your base reference planes, we'll first look at the standard base reference plane. And this has a set size. And this size control is found underneath the Solid Edge Options dialog under General. And you can see the reference plane is set to 120 millimeters for the metric. So if I go in and create a sketch, I'll select the front plane. The right and top plane become my corresponding Y and X axis in my sketch environment. And you can actually measure these. So you'll notice that the X is the 120 as shown in the options and the Y is actually 10% less just to help you distinguish between the two. If I want to create a sketch and draw in here, let's select rectangle by center. And you'll notice as I bring it out to here, I can actually get a good scale of the size without even having to look at the numbers. It right away gives me a scale. I know if I'm inside of this endpoints of these axes, I'm going to be less than 108 in this direction and less than 120 in this direction. But if I want to draw something extremely large, let's say 3000 in the X, and 500 in the Y, you'll notice that the sketch has gone off the screen. Now I can't zoom out yet because I haven't placed this. So I have to make sure I hit my zero in the angle or I have to use my scroll wheel to zoom out. Once I place it, then I can zoom out. And this can be a little cumbersome at times. So a little trick to get around that is to do the following. First, let's undo this sketch and get out of it. So we can go up to our solid edge options again. And we're going to resize this plane to 3000. Now it doesn't have to be 3000. It can be any size you want, obviously. So we'll go and select a sketch. We'll repeat that process and you'll notice how much easier it is now to draw a large shape and I get a good view of everything while I'm working on it. Now I want to show you one more advantage of doing this. Let's go back to our default setting. And you could only change this value outside of the sketch environment. Once you enter the sketch environment, this isn't accessible. Let's turn this shape on here. And you can see 
I've created this very large revolution and I want to add a protrusion at one end and I want to have it based on my top plane. So I go in and select here. I select my top plane and it automatically zooms into the reference plane. And then I have to zoom out again and go and do my work over here. If we undo this, we go back to here, change this back to 3000, say OK. And now if I select the extrude command, click here, the shape is still within the frame of the view here. So another good reason to have your base reference plane resize to the overall size of your shape. It limits the amount of zooming in and out that you have to do, which could save you some time. The next tip is our grid commands. Some users may not be aware that Solid Edge does have a grid capability inside. So I want to make sure people are aware of this. This allows you to sketch with the assistance of a grid overlay. You can control the grid spacing, display mode and origin and you can snap to a grid point. Elements are not constrained to the grid. It just allows you to position things. This is really good for layout. These are available in part, the sketch and profile environment, the assembly layout, and the draft environment. Allow me to demonstrate. We'll first look at the grid commands inside of the ordered paradigm. These will be found in your sketch environment. And this will be in part sheet metal and assembly sketches. It also appears in your 2D draft if you want it. Here are the grid commands and the grid options. You'll notice, for example, we have show grid. We have snap to grid. You can set that. You can have it key in X and Y values down here. You can reposition the zero. So maybe you want the zero to be up here or you can actually zero the origin back to the center. We have the grid options here, which gives you access to all those commands and more. For example, you can change the size and angle of the grid. You can change the color of the grid lines. You can have it snap to the grid using lines or using points. You can show alignment lines and you can show readout. Now readout's kind of cool. You can turn the grid off and still show readout. So you can actually almost use this to inspect certain things. And so you can see in here as we zoom in, we've got a tight grid here. Obviously, if we're doing a large layout, we would make our grid much larger. The grid also increases with the size of your base reference plane. In the previous demo where we made it 3000, the grid would encompass that. So I can just go in and I can have it start snapping to points if that's the, what you've set it up to do. And even though you're in here, you still have the ability to use your standard draw command. So for example, I could trim this up to close it up. Let's undo this. And I'm going to go in and turn this all off. And you'll notice, even though the grid's turned off, if I have show readouts, when I start drawing, I can actually get the readout. It's kind of a neat little trick. We used to use this before they put the little dimension box there. Let's close out of here. Now, for those of you who are using Synchronous, you may be wondering how you do this because we don't have a sketch environment in Synchronous. So let's transfer over to Synchronous. And we'll go to the sketching tab in the synchronous. We'll turn on the grid. And I'll say OK. And now as soon as I hit a command, draw command, the grid appears. If I lock the plane, let's do a top down view or sketch view as we call it. I can start drawing in my grid here. And notice if I exit the command, this stays here because I've locked the plane. As soon as I unlock the plane, the grid disappears. So we do have it in both paradigms. 
the advantage of either paradigm is going to be an argument that goes on forever. So I don't really care if you use ordered or synchronous. I just want to be able to show you how to use it in both. Tips and tricks number three is the helical curve command. Some of you may not be aware of this because it's found on the surfacing tab in our curves group. You have four types of helical curves to choose from. You have a constant pitch, a variable pitch, a compound, and a spiral curve. And in combination with some of our feature commands such as sweep, you can use this to make some complicated shapes. Let's have a look at this in Solid Edge. The helical command is found on the surfacing tab in the curves group. And when you first select it, you're prompted to click on a key point, space point, line, circle, cylindrical face, or cone face to define the axis. So I have this line here to define my axis. And notice as I select towards the bottom, it's going to start it here. If I go up here, it's going to put the start point up here. So let's select down here. And then I'm prompted to select the radius. I'm just going to pick on an endpoint there. And I have my helical curve drawn. It remembers the parameters that you used in the last helical curve creation. So I'm going to go in here and notice the parameters. We have the variable pitch, compound, and spiral. Let's just stick with the constant pitch. And you can have length and pitch, length and number of turns, or pitch and turns. So length and number of turns, let's make that four turns. You can see the result. I'll go back. Let's change that to pitch. Let's do a pitch of 10. And you can also have left-handed or right-handed. Choice is yours. Once you're done, you close that and hit finish. And you have your helical curve. Now, just to show you the other types here, I've created a variable curve. So you can see here that it, the pitch gets tighter as it goes up. I have a compound curve. And if we actually go in and edit this curve, you'll notice that we can actually control where along that curve we can change the diameter or the pitch, so you can get some fairly interestingly shaped curves. And we also have the spiral. And let's edit into here. And you can see you can control the, the width between the spirals and the overall spiral diameter. So that's our helical curve command. And just remember it's found on the surfacing tab. Number four and the last tip for this part is the bounded surface command. The bounded surface command creates a surface between curves or edges. This command is useful when you want to fill in gaps between other adjacent surfaces. The curve edge set must form a closed loop. Now there is an option where you can have it close it automatically for you. Adjacent faces can be used to control tangency on a new bounded surface. The key point curve command can be used to generate a boundary curve. This is one of my favorite surfacing commands, and I use it quite a bit, especially in dealing with foreign CAD data that needs to be patched. So let's have a look at this in Solid Edge. This is a typical situation that you may run into where the bounded surface command can be quite useful. I've imported this file from another system. You'll notice it's not created a solid. I'm going to go into the surfacing tab. I'm going to select show non-stitch edges 
click on here and you'll notice that we have some non-stitch edges here. Now if I zoom in, you'll notice there's a missing face there. Somehow in the translation it got consumed or lost. So what I'm going to do is close that command and I'm going to go to the bounded surface command. And I'm going to work my way around these edges. And you'll see because I have this option turned on to create a closed boundary, it's starting to close it up already. So I've grabbed all four edges. You also notice I can control natural, tangent, or curvature continuous here. I'll just leave it at natural and I'll accept that and hit finish. So I've now closed that off so I can go up to the stitch command. I'm going to say okay and accept the defaults and I want to stitch this and this together. I'll say preview and it's telling me that it's going to turn it into a solid. So I'll accept that and there's my solid part. So if you ever get a translation where you're missing faces or have gaps that are preventing you from turning into a solid, the bounded surface command can be quite useful. If you want to learn more, check out our new online training webpage at the link shown here. And here you can learn at your own pace with access to this 24-7. For more tips and tricks, watch for part two of this session in our next blog.